Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Divine Truth. The interview was held on the 28th of August 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 2, Part 2. Regarding Quality 4, mm -hmm. what does a soul-based understanding that divine truth does not and cannot compromise even for the sake of peace look like in my personal life? Well, we could, look, we could look at it in a number of ways here in our personal life because I feel when we ask this question about personal life, we need to look at our life generally, huma humanity's life on earth as well, you know, because mm -hmm. it, we see all sorts of examples both in our personal lives and also in humanity and the way in which nations operate with each other with this particular principle. Yeah. If we understand at the soul level that every time I compromise truth, I am going to result in more harm. I am going to create more harm to myself and others in my environment. Then there is a number of things that I would refuse to do. One of these things is I would refuse, once I know the truth on a certain subject and I know for certain it's God's truth and that's in my soul, I know that truth in my soul, I would no longer try to make it easier for everyone else to understand that. Mm. I would just state what the truth is. I wouldn't try to embellish it, modify it for public opinion, you know, try to make it sound better than it really is, any of those things. I would just present it as it is from a state of peace. So I wouldn't be angry with the world when I present it. I wouldn't be demanding of the world that the world accept it. I wouldn't be trying to force the world into some kind of change. I would just present the truth and let the world make its own choices. Anyone else other than myself make its own choices about that presentation of truth. So if we look at that in a relationship, Maybe okay. first. Yeah. So what that means, if I know a truth and I know that you don't believe it and we're in a relationship with each other, then what I will have to do is I would still present that truth, but I'd do it in a peaceful manner. I'd do it in harmony with love. I would do it without expectation or demand that you conform to it. I would do it without trying to manipulate you or control you subversively or, or uh, overtly um, in any manner. I would always respect your and honour your will about what you do, but I would still stay firm about the truth. Yeah. That's what I would do personally. And so conversely, and also because of what we know from quality number three, that divine love and divine truth are always in harmony. Mm -hmm. If I'm presenting a truth and I'm doing the opposite of those things that you just outlined, mm -hmm. then I have to even question if I know the truth. I don't know it. The reality is I don't know it. If I'm presenting a truth at this point in time and, and presenting it in a, in a way that's angry and raged and all these other things, then I don't really know it yet because yeah. there's other aspects of it that I've yet to discover. And so, for example, um, we know of someone who comes to our seminars who was in a, se a different seminar, a work training seminar, and the person presenting was... Um, presenting some things that they felt were in disharmony with divine truth. Mm -hmm. And they felt that they needed to stay firm for truth mm -hmm. and not compromise, but in effect they um, hijacked the entire seminar mm -hmm. and started arguing with the, um, mm -hmm. with the presenter. Yes, which is not what you would do if you were in harmony with divine truth. Yes, so you, what would the lack of compromise be in that situation? Well, for a start, a person who's gone to a seminar that something, where something else is being presented is an invited guest of the people that are present. And in this case, I think he was invited guest of the government, in fact, <laughs> <laughs> to help him get a job. Yeah. So, so he's an invited guest. As a guest, he has no right to try and hijack the seminar itself. He's allowed to be fixed and immovable on his own truth. And he would be peaceful about that. He wouldn't feel enraged that somebody is trying to tell him something that's different to what he believes. He would feel calm. He would feel okay. He'd say, no worries, I can hear that. He would sit there 
in silence the entire seminar and see anything that came from it as a gift at least to help him understand that he's now a bit more loving than he perhaps was before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he might not absorb anything that's been said because he disagrees with it all. Mm -hmm. He would sit there calmly without having to speak up and become overt about it. If it was his own seminar, that's different. If it was something that he was presenting, that he had paid for, that he had bought the seats for, that he had invited other guests to come along, now he can speak about what he feels in but that environment. Even in that environment, if he felt the need to be aggressive or demanding of people... Then he'd be out of harmony with truth itself. With love and, with and love. therefore with truth. Of, yes. of course. Yeah. So, so a person who's truly um, in harmony with these principles would be able to sit through hours, if not days, weeks or even months of unloving behaviour going on around him without compromising his own principles in his personal interactions, but without demanding that other people agree with him. He would also not um, avoid disagreement when he was asked, what's your personal opinion? He would tell a personal opinion. And when somebody gets angry with him, he would not get angry in return. Mm. He would always be peaceful himself, even though other people are not peaceful. And if other people want him to compromise in order to have peace, he wouldn't do that either. He would stay firm, but he would always be peaceful. Yeah. So the, a person who truly understands these principles would not go and hijack somebody else's seminar, for example, mm -hmm. would not go and hijack some kind of course or workshop, would not hijack what's going on even in people's day-to-day -day life. He, he would understand that he's allowed to have his own personal opinion and once it's truth, once it's God's truth, he will know it to be true. Mm -hmm. Once he knows it to be true, he will act in harmony with love. If he really knows it to be true, he will act in harmony with love and he will not compromise even when threatened or abused or mm -hmm. any other thing because he won't compromise love yeah. when he does that when, that, when somebody does that with him. He will always be loving in the circumstance and situation. And if he's not, he would realise, wow, there's still some more truth I have to accept. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another example. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, so I'm a vegan. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and say I'm invited to a family function, mm -hmm. which is not likely to happen to me anytime soon, but hypothetically speaking. Yeah. Um, uh, and I'm there and um, somebody's serving something that has some cheese in it and someone a relative of mine says look just eat it because otherwise your grandmother will notice and she'll be upset and what's it going to hurt you just to eat this thing um, just for the sake of peace today please mm. do this yeah it's loving <laughs> and it's not yeah it would be compromising for the sake of peace yeah. truth is of itself always truth Whenever you compromise it, things can only get worse. Mm -hmm. And so by, by, by doing something that compromises the truth, what you're in this example doing is you're harming yourself again through the ingestion of something that you know is out of harmony with love. So that's number one. Yeah. Secondly, you're actually harming your grandma who made it because you're not allowing her to have her confrontation of why she made something that was out of harmony with love in the first place. Or her unloving investment in me eating that thing. Of course. Yeah. That, that's a third thing. Why does she demand yeah. that, you, that you eat what she wants? Mm. That's not love either. Mm. So th there are a number of loving issues that this would force, you, force out into the open if you didn't move. But if you compromise, none of these issues will get raised. You'll have compromised yourself. So in other words, you've done something that's unloving, which will harm your own body, your own relationship with God, your own spiritual feelings about yourself and your own spirit body all will be harmed. Secondly, the person who expects you to eat it will be harmed because they will see that compromise is love and mm -hmm. it's not. Mm -hmm. Compromise is not love. Compromise, in fact, is very unloving. And thirdly, the person who created the, the concoction that you <laughs> meant to eat, that's out of harmony with love, wouldn't ever understand that, that what they've created has unloving parts to it they need to have a look at if they ever want to come into harmony with God's truths of the universe. Mm. So, so by, by compromising, you're actually causing 
more negative effects. When you stand firm, so you can just kindly say firm, no, I'm just not going to eat that. Uh, there's no way I can eat that. <laughs> and when somebody asks you why, you tell them why. And when somebody gets upset about that, you let them be upset about that. Yeah. And you don't get upset in return. And if somebody's so upset that, you're, that, that they're attacking you, you leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to do all of that. Yeah. Then you have been peaceful yourself, and, but also immovable and not compromising for the sake of peace. Yeah. And this is what divine truth does. God doesn't compromise God's truth for the sake of peace. If I can bring up some more global examples yes. where this has happened in history. In the First World War, um, the outcome, obviously, we know the First World War was that, that the German uh, attack failed mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, a peace was settled, as the saying goes, in which many compromises about God's laws were, were made, compromises of love and compromises of truth. Now, many of those compromises affect, affected the German people as a result. There was a lot of rage in the rest of the people who thought that the German race created the war. And as a result of this rage, they imposed many unloving and therefore untruthful uh, restrictions upon the German population. Now, of course, this bred feelings within the population of unfairness or a lack of um, equality. Mm -hmm. As this unfairness and lack of equality grew, eventually it laid the foundation for the political rise of someone like Hitler, mm -hmm. which eventually created the Second World War. And this is the problem with compromise on a national and international basis. What it does is it actually creates future conflicts down the track because one or both parties generally involved in a compromise are not happy. Yeah. The only way for two parties to become happy is for two parties to accept God's truths about the particular matter. That's the only way that two of you can become happy at any, any, with anything. That applies in a relationship. It also applies in a worldwide international incident. Mm. If we, you wanted to bring up a relationship or? A uh, worldwide. A worldwide, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, it's to do with the truth and reconciliation trials in South Africa. Yes. And so I'm not intimately aware with uh, all of the laws all involved. of the every the workings of those trials. Yeah. But um, from my rudimentary knowledge, I believe it was based on the idea that truth needed to be told. Mm -hmm. So much had happened under the apartheid uh, regime, regime, which was unfair and unloving. Yes, that um, that the idea was that people in local communities would come together and the truth would be told mm -hmm. about what happened. Mm -hmm. And then some kind of reconciliation or um, uh, punishment uh, or uh, that it would be decided upon in that forum. Didn't they decide that there would be no punishment? I'm not sure if mm. that was the... Uh, Similar to the situation in Lebanon where well, they that, decided after the war that uh, that everyone had done so many bad things that everyone would get away with everything. Actually, at <laughs> and the that end was of, the compromise. At the end of yeah, at the end of the twenty years of war, uh, yeah. they and then decided... we had the converse thing happening with regard to the end of the Second World War when the Nazis were taking the trial in the Nuremberg trials and and, and or the Nuremberg trials and and then. And then that went on for years and years and years afterwards, for 20, 30, 40 years even afterwards yeah. they were still proceeding. Yeah. So I suppose I'm talking about this relationship between truth and peace mm -hmm. and also when we strive for truth but we may not necessarily want God's truth in terms of what should happen mm. after we speak the truth. What do you feel about all of that? Well, I feel it's an oxymoron to say we're striving for truth but not willing to accept God's truth because the, the reality is that the only truths in the universe are God's truths. <laughs> They're the only truths. Mm -hmm. uh, everything else is personal opinion subject to variation. God's truths are fixed and immovable, not subject to variation. Yeah. Right? So the only thing that's worth attaining is God's truths on any issue. We do this automatically with many physical things, as I've pointed out. So when it comes to the truth about how a physical law works, we want to find it. Mm -hmm. We want to know how gravity works. We want to know how aerodynamics works. We, 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 we spend years of research 
<laughs> finding out such things. But when it comes to issues or laws surrounding love and laws surrounding how the human soul works, we ignore almost them all. Mm. And this is our problem. We can't expect to continue ignoring truths and, and, and therefore have any positive results afterwards. Mm -hmm. Whenever we ignore God's truths, there will always be negative results. Now, many people on earth have ideas of compromise. They believe that compromise works. Now, there's been experiments in compromise, just as there has been experiments in no compromise. And basically, none of the experiments have worked in either direction. Mm. And the main reason why is this, because none of them are true. None of the experiments that have been carried out in these regards are true. When there was no compromise, there was no factoring in of repentance, there was no desire to achieve repentance, which are all parts of the truths of God's laws. Yeah. And as a result, there's an, ignore, an ignorance of the emotional truths of God's laws. In other words, we're focused on discovering the physical ones, mm -hmm. but we're not focused on discovering the spiritual and emotional ones. If we were focused on the spiritual and emotional truths of God's laws and we applied all of them in these situations, every one of them would now be resolved completely. Mm. Every single one of them. It, it is the compromise of mm. God's truths with regard to these particular events mm. that cause further trauma and pain in any or all of the people involved. Mm. And this is what we need to understand. Whenever we compromise God's truths, we're not creating peace. We're creating a fictitious state in which the emotions of the people involved with these particular events are never released and therefore fester like an open wound to come out at some future time. Mm -hmm. And you see this happening globally in nations themselves, in religious organisations and in personal relationships. You see the same principle occurring right across the board. Yeah. In personal relationships, there's this common viewpoint that if I compromise my personal viewpoint in order to have some more peace, our marriage will last longer. But it doesn't. All that happens is I know I've compromised and I'm upset about that. You know that I haven't really come to your opinion at all. I've just made a compromise that's not real and you're upset about that. Yeah. And in the end, at, at some point in the future, it will all come bursting out in some other way. If we both had a goal to conform to God's truth and therefore conform to God's love with regard to the subject, now both of us will need to compromise, but we're not compromising God's truth. We are working from our place of untruth to God's truth. In other words, we're getting to the point where we decide we're going to honour God's truth only, and we're going to realise that both of us have to change in order to accept that truth. Until, yeah. Now we have the true op opportunity for peace mm. in the relationship, in a nation, in religions, and in the entire world internationally, when we are all willing to accept what is the actual truth. We have all accepted the actual truth about gravity. We've all accepted the actual truth about aerodynamics, it's time we all started to accept the actual truth about love. Yeah. <laughs> but we are very resistive to that, unfortunately. <laughs> all right, so uh, perhaps to finish off, I'll just read out some of the notes that you've written here of what it would mean if I personally had this truth, mm. this soul-based understanding of sure, this truth. Sure, sure. So, um, I would refuse to compromise divine truth in my day-to-day -day life even for the sake of peace or expedience, which you've covered. Yep. Even if I seem destined to lose something, I yes. never compromise truth, personal or God's. And this is an important point. A lot of people realise that when they stay immovable, there's, a, there's usually the potential for other people to attack them. So this is something that we get quite frequently. You know, the media attacks us when we're unmovable on a certain issue. Other people attack us when we're unmovable on a certain issue. And the majority of people on the planet have learnt that under those circumstances, they're always going to lose something. And so what they do is they try to avoid losing it mm. by compromise. But in the end, it's always going to work out worse for them and particularly worse for their soul, but also worse for every single person around them if they do. 
So it's very important to not compromise on these issues. It works out worse for the people around them because the people around them don't get to see what the problem is. Yeah. All they finish up doing is believing that they are right when they're not right. Mm. And, uh, and this is a big problem that we face on the planet. If we don't stand up for truth and stay in peace while we're doing it, the people who are in error don't get to see their error. Yeah, and I suppose I can think of a very personal example again. And um, I mentioned, I made a joke about my family earlier, but I suppose that when you and I formed a relationship, when we started our relationship, my family protested quite a lot and they resorted to being quite aggressive and abusive mm. towards both of us verbally mm -hmm. and emotionally and trying to manipulate me. And so I reached a point eventually where I felt like I couldn't compromise the truth that that was unloving mm. and that that was unjust actually mm -hmm. towards the both of us. And I understand what you're saying that if I, ha the expectation from my family was that I should compromise mm. and just overlook what had happened in the past and move on. Mm. Uh, and I can see now that if I had have done that, I would have allowed them to feel that that was okay with me, what had happened. Mm. But this, and I realised that if I wasn't going to compromise, I would lose them from my life. Mm -hmm. But in actual fact, I already felt that I had lost them mm -hmm. because this um, love had been... Broken. Broken. Already. Yeah. And this is the thing is often what we're trying to save when we compromise has already been lost. Mm. And the compromise doesn't help it at all. No, it just prolongs the pain, doesn't it? And well, it's a way to avoid pain mm. because we don't come to a full recollection or a full acknowledgement of what we've lost. Yeah. You know, by compromising, uh, some kind of semblance of a relationship would have been maintained but you would have always felt like it wasn't loving anymore. Mm. So you would, all, you would have still lost it. And, and the only thing you would have been avoiding would be your own pain yes. with regard to the acknowledgement of the loss. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is the problem with compromise that causes us to believe that, uh, that things are better when they are still the same as they've always been. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and, and this is not a good way to get more and more truth from God, no. to believe, to stay where they're always the same. Yeah. We need to get things better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I continue with the sure. list. Um, so when I have a soul-based understanding of this, I'm not afraid of giving up my addictions or comforts so that I can get closer to God. Exactly. Like quite, quite often what we want to do is we want God to compromise for the sake of God's truth. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of like the flip side of this, is that divine truth will never compromise even for the sake of peace. What we want to have happen is, God, you compromise because I don't want to give up my addictions. Yeah. You compromise. I don't want to give up my sadness. You compromise. I don't want to give up my fear. You compromise. I want to be angry when I can be angry. You know, And we want God to compromise on all of these issues. If we truly had a soul-based understanding of this particular divine, quality of divine truth, we would go, I realise that I can't ask God to compromise on any of these issues. If I want to be closer to God, I'm the one that's going to have to do something about my addiction, my fear, my anger my, and my sadness. Mm. I'm the one that's going to have to choose to feel it all. And you, so you wouldn't avoid all the feelings so much and you wouldn't be there in a great big rage with God in rebellion saying, how dare you make me go through all of this because you realise that it's all for the sake of loving you that God's for asking you to go through this. He's not even forcing you. He's asking you to go <laughs> through it. But he's saying to you, I'm not going to be able to have a closer relationship with you unless you do it. Yeah. And, and, and most people on earth don't like that. They want a closer relationship with God. They want all the benefits of a relationship with God without having to get rid of all the things out of harmony with truth yeah. in their relationship with God. So that's, if we truly felt this quality of divine truth in our soul that God's truth isn't going to compromise, even for the sake of peace, then we wouldn't expect God to say uh, to to give us divine love while we're purposefully doing a heap of things that are out of harmony with love and truth. Yeah. We wouldn't expect God to do that. Yeah. We would acknowledge that. And we wouldn't be even in a rage with God about that because we'd understand yeah, God's just wanting me to have real changes, not mm. changes that are just figments of my imagination or manufactured because of my intellect, but real soul-based changes. That's what God wants me to do. 
So I wouldn't be complaining to God about that. No. Okay. Mm. I, I refuse to conform to other people's addictions for the sake of peace or personal gain. Mm. A lot of times when we conform to other people's addictions, it's for the sake of personal gain. In other words, we give them something in order to get something from them. And the reality is a lot of times we're prepared to give them what they, their addiction demands in order to get what our addiction demands. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates codependence, but it's also what creates a lot of badness on the planet, this, this exchange of addictive behaviour. If we really understood this quality of divine truth and we had some truth in our heart, what we would do instead of doing that is go, okay, even if I'm going to personally seemingly gain, and it's not a real gain because it's not real, mm -hmm. but it's a seeming gain. If I'm going to personally seemingly gain from compromise, then I've got to, uh, then I've got to say to myself, okay, this is not something God would do. So it's not real gain. And it also is harming myself and the other person. Mm. And, and we need to see it as such. And if we understood this principle of divine truth, we would see compromise of truth as a harmful thing, not as something that supports our life, but rather something that degrades it. Yeah. That's how we'd see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I refuse to soften the truth in order to make the truth more acceptable to others. Yes, this okay. is about making the truth more tasty, I call it, or yeah. making it more palatable or making it so that more people will listen to it. You know, the reality is the unadulterated truth as God presents it is the only way to present it. The reason why, and this is why God is immovable in the way God presents the truth even. God's immovable because God knows that every time you try to embellish it, Every time you try to make it nice, every time you try to make it easy to take, it ends up with disaster in, in, the, in well, the It's track. a compromise of it's the It's always truth. a compromise yeah. of the truth. And it ends up in disaster every time. And, uh, and in fact, God's laws are attempting to correct you from doing such a thing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. the sad, yeah. that's the sad thing. Every time we think we're embellishing it, God's laws are going, stop embellishing it. You know, <laughs> stop embellishing it. And we're going, I want to embellish it because, and, and the because is always because we have some kind of thing we want in return for the embellishment. We want a result. We want people to change or there's always something that we want. Mm -hmm. if we're, the beauty of not compromising is that we also then have to deal with internally all the things we want through the compromise. Yeah. We have to feel that we don't have them or don't, didn't get them. And we have to feel about it. If we're truly at the soul level, we would be feeling about it. Yeah. And this is great because it releases things within us if we do that. And so it's a powerful thing to not allow the compromise, even if you desperately want it, <laughs> and, and to then feel about the results of the lack of compromise inside of yourself. What, what, you know, feel the attack, feel the abuse, feel, feel all those things you're avoiding. There are things you're avoiding. Yeah. Or feel the fact that you didn't get what you wanted. Yeah. Feel the fact that nothing happened the way you'd like. You know? yeah. Feel those things. Yeah. And in the end, I think when you receive this um, soul-based understanding of this truth, you do feel that the truth can't be made more tasty or of interesting course. or appealing. How can God's truth be made more appealing than God's already made it? Yes. You're basically saying by embellishing it, you're basically saying to God, you know, you didn't make it good enough. I'm better than you. <laughs> I can make it better. Yeah. That's really what you're saying. And the arrogance of that position is so extreme that it's no wonder that there's laws that correct it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, next point we have when we have a soul-based understanding of the fact that divine truth does not compromise is that I act in harmony with divine truth at all times even when I'm afraid or terrified. Yes. The main reason why we compromise in any situation is because of fear or ter being terrified. We are afraid that something will occur that we do not wish to occur. Now, fear is something that opposes love and truth. When a person's afraid, they are always generally re rejecting truth. And also, love can never be perfected while fear exists. Mm. 
So, so whenever we act in compromise, we're acting upon our fears. And whenever we act upon our fears, we're not understanding that we're actually preventing our personal growth in truth and love by acting upon our fears. Instead, what we need to do is choose to feel our fears, mm -hmm. to let them go, experience them and let them go. Then we have the ability to absorb more truth and also to perfect our love. So, so compromise for the sake of, of supporting fear or avoiding fear is a, is a very, very dangerous road. And it's a, uh, it's a false peace that we attain through doing that. Well, more often than not, we don't even obtain peace through it. What we obtain is more oppression. You look at almost every society that is engaged in this fear-based process, they end up with more oppression, mm. more damage, more attack, not less. Yeah. And, you know, it's only societies that stand up to truth with truth in harmony with God's love that actually result in less of those things. Yeah. And, and this is something that we haven't learnt yet. Most people on the planet haven't learnt yet. They still think that they can compromise for fear's sake and actually have a good outcome. Yeah. All of God's laws are actually saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're going to have a bad outcome doing this because you're honouring fear. And, and if you look at a lot of the things that are happening on around the earth today, it's because we honour fear so much that we can't love anymore. We can't speak in harmony of truth anymore. We honour fear so much that the reality can't be exposed. And as a result, most of us end up with a lot of pain and suffering. Mm. Mm. Okay, this next one's interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm not always attempting to get a common intellectual ground with people in rage or hatred. Yes, now this is a very important thing to understand about compromise. Mm -hmm. Persons that are enraged or in hatred or resentment are attacking you. They are not peaceful. Mm -hmm. They ha need to have their rage and hatred exposed as an unloving thing within themselves. If you compromise when they are enraged or in hatred, you're supporting their rage and hatred. You're supporting their ability to control you mm -hmm. by doing what they wish to do when they're enraged or in hatred. Mm -hmm. To do such a thing means that not only are you compromising yourself and God's truths, but you're actually helping them become even worse a person than they currently are. And so you, you are actually now responsible partially for aiding and assisting them in their enraged or angry behaviour. Yeah. And this is very out of harmony with love and therefore out of harmony with divine truth. And so essentially you're saying any time we try to even reason and converse and uh, have a really rageful, angry person see our point of view, we're actually compromising? Is that what you mean? No, I'm saying if you have to compromise in order to have their rage reduced, then you are not in harmony with God's truth. Okay, thank you. If you're willing to just sit there and talk, talk to them, talk them through their rage, and eventually they come to see reason and they calm down, well, that's different. Mm -hmm. you, but you would not embellish or compromise God's truth in order to do so. Sure. Sure. Okay. Next one. I love all people enough to say truth, even if it means losing their friendship or approval. Yes, and this is a very important aspect to understand about this part of God's truth. The reason why God's truth doesn't compromise is because God's truth loves. Yeah. And what, what I mean by that is that the, God knows that when we discover more divine truth, remember Divine truth is universal truth. It's the absolute truth of the universe. When we discover more of it, we're going to have a happier existence. We're going to have more joy. We're going to have more satisfaction in life. We're going to have more growth. Therefore, there is only positive results of knowing more truth. Mm -hmm. Now, God's truth knows that. And so this is one reason why it doesn't compromise. Because it knows that if it compromises, it compromises all of those things. It compromises joy, peace, real peace I'm talking about, not the fake one. And it, and it compromises 
the person, God, every, everything that is compromised through the compromise of truth. Mm. Their ability to grow, their ability to change, their ability to become more loving is all compromised. And if we understood that, we would actually see telling the truth as an act of love. We wouldn't see it as something to avoid. We would see it as something we always need to do. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, great. Okay, last one. I never feel anything related to truth or love is too hard or time consuming. Yeah, exactly. What I see a lot of people doing is they almost go like, I haven't got the time right now to be loving. I just got to get this thing over and done with. Yeah. And they don't understand in that place that every time they compromise, and to compromise is against this process of divine truth, it's against one of the qualities of divine truth. Every time we compromise, we're basically saying that it's going to take longer because all of God's laws are constructed mm. to make it go as short as possible, to be as economical as possible, to make yes. everything happen as quickly as possible. Yeah. And every time I compromise, I'm compromising God's law's ability to do that. Yeah. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going to make everything longer. I'm going to make everything worse. Yeah. I'm going to have to have spend more time <laughs> rather than less yeah. on a particular thing. And, and so I see a lot of people thinking that they're compromising for the sake of experience and time. And in the end, they finish up spending five times, 10 times, 15 times more time than what they would have spent if they had lived in harmony with truth. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, mm. really wonderful things mm. about that, yeah. that quality, isn't there? Yeah. So th this quality number four, I feel, is a pretty important quality, understanding that God's truth, once you know it, it never compromises. Understand that's very, very different to personal truth. In my opinion, my own personal truth, I always need to compromise mm -hmm. all the time. I, in my personal life, I'm always compromising because I know that there's things I don't know. And on those things I don't know, I need to be willing to compromise very rapidly if yes. I'm going to receive God's truth because it's God's truth that is the thing that won't compromise. Yeah. And unless I'm willing to change and, and, and develop then, and, and therefore compromise my own truth, I'm never going to grow towards God's. Mm. So understand that this quality is about God's truth, not about your own. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> and, and in fact, all of these qualities are about God's truth, about not, yes. not necessarily yeah. your own. It's only when you bring your truth into harmony with God's truth that you will then not compromise yourself on that particular truth. And in fact, this whole discussion that we're having today, this series of questions, gives us a lot of clues as to whether our personal truth is anywhere in the ballpark of God's truth. Exactly. And so if we find that what we believe to be true me is not matching up with these other qualities, yep. then we already know, hey, maybe I need to We're way, way out of God's truth. Yes, yeah. yeah. So, so, so far we've done those four qualities, mm -hmm. right? So we've done the first quality, which is God's truth is infinite. So every time I think, God's, that every time I think truth is finite... I know everything about this. I know everything about something. No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> Only God knows everything about everything. Yeah. We will come to know more about every subject and there are certain things that will solidify, mm -hmm. certainly. But uh, if we believe that it's not infinite, then, then you know, we have no idea what God's truth really is. Mm -hmm. If we believe it, that it's going to move, if we believe that we can move it around, push it around, manipulate yeah. it, it's not true. Yeah. If we believe that it's out, we can do it out of harmony with love, not true. If we believe we can compromise, not true. Mm. And if that's what we're doing, compromising, being out of harmony with love, you know, trying to manipulate or move things around, negotiate with God. Changing it. Right. Uh, or we believe it's all fine out, then we know we're a long way away from where God's truth is as in terms of its qualities. Yeah. yeah. Our truth, God's truth, like day and night. Yeah. <laughs> night and day, probably night, our yeah. truth, yeah. day, God's truth. And that's the beauty of truth is it exposes everything. God's truth exposes everything. Our truth doesn't. Our truth wants to keep us staying, it keep us where we are, no change. That's part of these qualities. So, so, so far we've discussed four. We'll try to discuss another three in this session. Yeah. Um, but um, we need to understand already that if, we, if we've just used those four qualities alone, you could see and analysed your own personal life and your own personal belief systems with those four qualities. You could see you could throw out half of what you believe. <laughs> <laughs> if you were humble, you'd throw it all out. But often we're not humble, so we hold on to it, right? Yeah. 
But if we're truly humble within, in the light of these particular qualities, we throw out half of what we believe automatically. Yeah. And we haven't even, we've only got to quality number four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have discussed the others, we have the other 10 that we've still got to go eventually. Yeah. And I feel it's important for people to see that, that this is a lot of accepting these particular things is about humility. Mm. And that's a different discussion in itself. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mm. Okay. Quality five. What do you mean when you say divine truth itself with all the power and knowledge it ha that it has at, as its foundation will not compel a man to accept it against his will? Well, firstly, we need to acknowledge in this particular quality that divine truth is one of the most powerful forces in the universe. Mm. It, it, is, it, is, it is the way in which the entire universe operates, in fact. Every single law that governs the operation of the universe is a divine truth, is a God's truth. It is an absolute truth, a universal truth. And because of that, it has a huge amount of power at its disposal. The, all the power of God is behind these truths that are all God's truths. Mm -hmm. So we need to firstly understand that, that these truths are immeasure, uh, unimaginably powerful. However, because God gave humankind this gift of free will, God does not use this power in order to manipulate the will of humans. Mm. All God does is govern the entire universe with this power, but allows humans to make a choice to bring their truth, their knowledge into harmony with divine truth, or to live out of harmony, either knowingly or ignorantly, with God's truth. So God's truth never forces itself upon humanity. God's truth is encouraging humanity to discover it, and God's truth doesn't compromise the rest of the universe by allowing humanity to have free will. Mm -hmm. But it does allow humanity to decide what to do in its sphere, in its sphere of operation. So wherever humanity lives, whether it be here on earth or in the spirit dimensions, they have the choice to bring themselves into harmony with God's truth or not. Yeah. And God will never force them to bring themselves into harmony with God's truth. Mm -hmm. God will even never force them to, do, to, to have to discover divine truth. Yeah. God will just wait until we take, have desire and take the opportunity to discover divine truth. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important quality of God's truth in that it doesn't work against this gift of free will. God has given humanity the gift of free will and as such always honours this gift and the truth itself, the universal truth, honours the gift of mankind's free will. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow mankind's free will to break the laws of the universe without consequences. Yeah. But it does allow mankind to exercise their will out of harmony with love if they wish to. Of course, it always has negative consequences. But, but he is allowed to do it. Mankind is allowed to do it. And God will never force mankind to change. Yeah. God only educates us through this process. Yeah. yeah. And so if we personalise that, we can make a stand for divine love and divine truth. But the minute we're going to fight for it, we've actually abandoned both. Exactly. Yeah. As soon as we start to fight for what we believe is true, whether that's verbally fight, emotionally fight, or physically fight mm -hmm. for what we believe is true, whether we are, when I say verbally fight, I mean be angry and upset about what we believe is true, project upon other people our rage, then what we're doing is we are compromising this attribute of divine truth. So therefore, we're not in harmony with it. Yeah. God's truth doesn't do that. God doesn't yell and scream at us every time we break one of God's laws. God doesn't yell and scream of us even if we're going to break one of God's laws. Yeah. And God doesn't yell and scream of us at us after we've broken one of God's laws even. Yeah. God just educates us through this process where divine truth is Im immovable. It always will have consequences as, as another quality of, its, of, of it that we'll learn later. And as a result, 
it doesn't need to yell and scream and it doesn't need to fight and it doesn't need to push us around. It doesn't need to do anything because by itself it is immovable. Yeah. It is the, one of the most powerful forces in the universe aside from God's love. Mm. And as such, it has a huge amount of power to change us and, to change, and, and the entire oper uni, operation of the universe is dependent upon it. And, and so once we respect that, that it will not break this underlying feeling of love, which is a feeling of, I am not going to manipulate your will. I'm not going to control your will. I'm not going to passively or aggressively attempt to change your will. I'm just going to ask you to change your will. Yeah. Once we understand that, we would never engage in any activity that would result in damaging another person through the exercise of truth. Now, if you think about how that applies to religious, religious, most religious institutions on the earth, religious institutions have a terrible history of forcing themselves to, to even murder and do many things, torture and murder, in order to impose themselves upon another nation or another people. Mm -hmm. This is, the, this is an indication that most of human religion is actually forgetting this underlying truth about God, about God and yeah. about what, how God's created the universe. Okay, do you want to talk about some more examples in the next question? Yeah, we'll do yeah. the examples in yeah. the next question. If we yeah. look at the flavour of it in this question, that would be good. Yeah. Mm. Okay, well, I think you've pretty much covered, covered everything. Most of that. Yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. Good. Okay. Regarding quality five, mm -hmm. what does a soul-based understanding that divine truth itself with all the power and knowledge that it has at its foundation will not compel a man to accept it against his will look like in my personal life? <laughs> well, again, uh, you know, what we do in our personal life and what we do in society is often very much reflected of what we do in our personal life. Yeah. So, so when we examine this question, we can see that it's going to affect a lot of society-based decisions as well as personal decisions. Yeah. When we honour the gift of free will, we allow people to make their own choices and decisions. And the only time that we would restrict a person's choice and decisions, and the restrictions would all have to occur harmonious with love, mm -hmm. is when the person chose to exercise their will in such a manner that would create other problems for other people. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if a person decided that they wanted to commit suicide, they're only affecting themselves, depending on how they do it. Yeah. You know, if they do it in a very messy way, then they're affecting some other people. Yeah. <laughs> if they do it very cleanly, they're only affecting themselves. Yeah. We would not try to force a person or to stop them from doing it unless there were certain conditions involved. Mm -hmm. One of those conditions might be that a person might be spirit influenced and therefore we would firstly want to remove the spirit influence from the person and once we had done that, then allow them to make their own choice yeah. uh, whether, about whether they would like to kill themselves or not. But if you look at what God does, God allows any person who wishes to suicide to suicide. Mm. God doesn't stop them. God tries to educate them. God tries to show them through lots of different means, both angelic and people on earth, mm -hmm. that it's not a wise choice to make. Mm -hmm. But in the end, God doesn't stop them from doing it. And the reason why is because it's an exercise of their will. They're allowed to make a choice that's out of harmony with love. And God's truth, which is don't do it, mm. <laughs> because you're going to have a lot of pain if you do it, isn't forced upon them. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to make the choice. And God doesn't make rules about them making the choice. God allows them to do it. And this is what we need to understand, is that even when a person is ready to harm themselves, God is not going to intervene. God's, God will try to help them, but God is not going to intervene. He's not going to forcefully stop them from harming themselves. So if we personalise <clears throat> that, 
not only can I not expect God to intervene if I'm doing something that's out of harmony with truth. That's personally harmful. That's personally harmful. Yes. Uh, or even harmful and, towards and also, others. And also, can I, I can not expect God to intervene with the consequences of such behaviour. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Often what people do is they want to take the behaviour, but want God to intervene with the consequence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and God's yeah. not going to do either of those things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but neither will I compel others to accept truth about things. Exactly. Because I'll respect their free will. I would, so I wouldn't force them through some kind of act of violence or rage or something like that to believe what I believe. Mm. I would never choose to take such or actions. Or to do what I think is loving. Or, or to do what I think is right. Or even what is right from God's perspective. Yes. Mm. To do what I know is right from God's perspective, I still wouldn't force them. Yeah. To do yeah. what is right from God's perspective. I might encourage them. I might educate them or attempt to. I might talk to them about the principles or matters involved. But I won't force them. Mm. I won't bully them. I won't control them or even manipulate them through the withholding or the delivery of information that's false. I won't do any of those things in order to control their will. Yeah. You see this happening in religions a lot today where where there's this uh, constant making of laws to control people's will. So, so, for example, religion is not content with God's laws. So what they decide is they need to make a whole heap of other laws to support God's laws. Mm. <laughs> and so what they then do is finish up making a lot of man-made laws. For example, a law, you have to have a, a written certificate of marriage before you live together. Well, God doesn't have that law. God hasn't provided a written certificate of marriage to anybody in the universe who has ever become married. <laughs> God knows that it's love that binds the two people together. So when I attempt to force you to get a written certificate before I would acknowledge that you're in a partnership with another person, what I am doing is forcing my will upon you. Yeah. And when I'm doing that, I'm out of harmony with divine truth because God, knowing the full truth, never does that. So you, not even knowing the truth, are doing it. You're doing it. So there's something wrong. And that's an indication that you don't have this kind of law or principle of understanding about the quality of divine truth in your soul. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some of the other things that we've listed here. Uh, if we have a soul-based understanding of this truth or this quality, mm -hmm. that um, we respect the free will of others, even when those others choose to harm us with their will. Yes. And this is a very interesting part of this in the sense that we understand and acknowledge that when we're living particularly here on earth, people are, uh, God is allowing people to make choices. And sometimes the people will make choices to personally harm us. We would not revert to violence in retaliation to this harm. Now, that is a very difficult thing for the majority of people on this planet to accept. Mm. God doesn't revert to violence in retaliation of harm, so we also need to not revert to violence in order to retaliate against personal harm. This is what it means to be Christ-like. And yet, if you look at the actions of the majority of religious faiths, <clears throat> they revert to harm whenever their personal life is attacked in any way. And even in our personal lives, we do that, don't we? We often do that. Yeah. If you look at, you know, we often revert, resort to resentful and hateful activities as a result of harm perpetrated against us. So when somebody harms us, we then feel that we are justified in perpetrating violence towards that person in some way. When we do that, we are not understanding this principle of God's truth. God never does that. Yeah. We are not in harmony with this quality if we do it. Mm. <laughs> Similarly, even if we just uh, withdraw from that person in a state of... Um, anger or rage. Anger or rage, mm. yeah. So yeah. when we withdraw from people, we may withdraw from people to, in order to protect ourselves from their particular you know, projections at us or in order to make a stance about the, that we believe their behaviour is unloving. So mm -hmm. those things would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. But if we're withdrawing from people in order to express our rage, mm -hmm. we're already having rage go from ourselves to that person. Yeah. That is a violent attack. Yeah. That is out of harmony with this principle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You see this happening a lot in marriages where 
women are withdrawing sexually from their partners, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is occurring because of rage. The woman is in a rage about sexual matters. She doesn't wish to address this particular emotion. And instead what she chooses to do is withdraw from the relationship sexually and emotionally. And, and, then, and, and she then thinks that's great. You know, like that she's more peaceful now. Yeah. No, she's not. <laughs> she has both compromised, but also she has not respected the will of her own will or the will of another in that mm. particular example. Mm. Because she, she doesn't see that if she withdraws, she is not allowing the will to be expressed and then working through the issues that cause her to want to reject it. So, in other words, she's not allowing her husband to express his love for her and, and not working through whether she really wants to be in the relationship or not. Mm -hmm. She's not allowing him to make a choice. She's not saying to him, I'm never going to have sex to you again, with you again. And then he could say, well, I'm never going to live with you again. You know what I mean? Yes. He's, when we withhold information that is important to other people, we are in fact affecting their will. Mm. If... If, if you need certain information in order to have an open and free and understanding relationship with me, it is, imper it is, it is my imperative to give it. I must do it. Yeah. If, I, if I withhold that information, I am influencing your will. I am basically withholding information that you may make a different decision with if you knew it. And when I do that, I am not honouring this gift of free will. So... I'm not understanding this basic principle of equality of divine truth in that place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I understand that divine truth will not compel a man to accept it against his will, I don't attempt to manipulate others, even when I could easily do so, knowing their emotions. Mm -hmm. I do not force people to accept the truth, but rather respond to their desire to receive the truth. Mm -hmm. So can we maybe discuss some of these already? Sure. Let, let's look at the manipulation thing. Mm -hmm. We see this going on a lot in relationships where, where people get manipulated back and forth, back and forward. And, and the manip purpose of the manipulation is to get a result we want. Yeah. God doesn't do that. God just presents the truth and lets the person make up their own mind about how they're going to choose to use that truth. Yeah. God doesn't try to manipulate that. He tries to encourage loving behaviour through the laws, mm -hmm. but he doesn't force you into loving behaviour. He lets you make your own choices. And even every time we present a facade in a relationship, we are in effect manipulating that situation. Of course. We're saying, uh, here is Here's this is a false me. me. But it's just a false version of me. Yeah. And I, there has to be a, something that I want from in return. That, in, in return from that. And I'm really attempting to manipulate the will of another yeah. rather than just present my real me yeah. as I am right now, warts and all as the saying goes, yeah. and let the person make up their own mind about whether they want to be with me or not. Yeah. The irony is the majority of people are very attracted to that. Yeah. And most people would be more willing to engage a relationship under those circumstances, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is true. the law <laughs> of truth. Yeah. And the second one you mentioned was what? Uh, I, the... I don't force people to accept truth, but I do respond to their desire to yes, receive Yes, this it. is very, very important. Yeah. Um, we, we often don't, uh, we don't understand one basic principle about truth, and that is that a person who doesn't have a desire to receive it in their heart, will never receive it. They cannot, can they? They cannot. Yeah. God's truth is all heart-based truth. Mm -hmm. And so unless you have a desire to receive it, you aren't going to receive it. So it's pointless giving it. <laughs> it's pointless giving the truth to a person who has no desire to receive it. And so this is a very important point. This is almost like attempting to force them to receive truth when they don't have a desire to have it. Mm. Mm. And it's a very beautiful thing when a heart does desire truth. Of course. It? Yeah. It's just so lovely then. Because when a heart's desiring truth, they can absorb as much truth as, you, as you're able to give. Yeah. That's, that's and beautiful. actually this, this um, power and knowledge that divine truth has it, as its foundation, which is a part of this quality that we're discussing, mm -hmm has the ability to enter the soul of another person. And transform it completely. Yeah, mm. and that's very beautiful. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so understanding this quality, that divine truth, very powerful, um, and doesn't compel people against its will, means that I never use 
truth mm -hmm. about others to alleviate my own addictions or gain personally. Mm. What we see happening a lot is people have a tendency to use truth or their knowledge of truth about other people in order to pull down other people and destroy their character or nature. This their self-esteem, really, isn't it's it? It's really trying to pull down somebody's self-esteem and yeah. worth. Yeah. And the reality is that people who do this obviously have very poor self-worth mm. and they're attempting to pull down others' worth below their own. Um, unfortunately, they have a lot of soul-based degradation that occurs as a result of their actions. But doing so is actually an act that doesn't honour this divine truth, the quality of divine truth. And that is the quality of divine truth is that it never forces itself upon another person, but it's always truthful, but it never has a personal motivation of forcing somebody else to feel a certain thing. Yeah. It always has a personal motivation of attempting to help or heal a person. That's what God is constantly doing. That's the power of truth. It's the power of healing that occurs. That's why it's the truth that sets you free. Now, when we personally pull down other people, we tell either lies or the truth to pull down people, we are proving that we have a motivation, a manipulative motivation of harming another person purposefully. And when we have those kind of motivations, we are really attacking them. So we're really doing something by force. Mm. And this would not be a loving action. Mm. Mm. All right. I never manipulate others or events by withholding portions of truth. Yes, I think we've already we've discussed sort of covered that. that haven't yes. we? I never attempt to force a person into their emotions when they do not wish to feel emotional. Exactly. So this is the same kind of principle. I'm not trying to force the truth into a person emotionally when I know that they don't want to feel any emotion. What's the point of doing that? Why not just have an intellectual discussion of the truth if you feel like, like, you, like you wish to and see whether they're open to letting that soak into them emotionally at some point in their future yeah. rather than trying to force them to be emotional as a result of what you're telling them. And this is again an attempt to manipulate their will. And every time we attempt to manipulate another person's will, we are out of harmony with God's truth. And, uh, and so you can see there's religions on the planet, there's politics on the planet, there's all sorts of you know, universal institutions on the planet, right? When I say universal, worldwide institutions on the planet. And all of these institutions, many of them are governed totally by this a desire to manipulate the will of others. <laughs> <laughs> and many of them would have to disappear under this particular principle. Yeah. And God doesn't do any of those things. But because God's laws are also immovable, you can't break them without there being consequence. Um, it's impossible to circumnavigate the law yeah. through, through force as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Quality six, what do you mean when you say mm -hmm. divine truth will never and can never accommodate itself to the beliefs of men? Well, this quality of divine truth is obviously linked to some other qualities we've already discussed, and that is that divine truth is immovable. It has a, you know, this characteristic that you can't change it, that, it, that it's infinite in its nature and those kind yeah. of qualities. And so the, the, this, now, this particular quality, though, defines a relationship, if you like, between divine truth and mankind. Mm. Humankind constantly desires this, um, but particularly, again, not with physical things, but with emotional and spiritual matters, desires that they can have hold, hold on to their own truths. Yeah. They believe that they can be um, and believe things from a spiritual and emotional perspective that, that they have the right to do so, in fact, which of course they have been given the will to do so, mm. but not necessarily the right to do so. Because, it, because the right implies the, an, angry, uh, um, an angry holding on to false beliefs and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, God, all of God's laws are created to encourage us to shift from that perspective. But the majority of people on earth believe that they should be able to hold on to their own truth and have a relationship with God at the same time. So you see people in all sorts of different religious formats thinking that their particular belief is the belief of that, that 
is the true belief about God. Uh -huh. They believe, so if you ask a Christian what's the true belief about God, he'll quote the Bible, this and the Bible, that, and mention all of these things. If you ask a Muslim what the true belief about God is, he'll quote the Koran, this, and, and have, have some. If you ask a Hindu what the true belief is about God, he'll quote all different things. If you ask a Buddhist, he'll mm -hmm. quote different things again. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because mankind has made up all of their own ideas about God. Mm -hmm. They've made up all of their own ideas about what divine truth is. They've made up all of their ideas about what is absolute truth. Now, God's truth doesn't conform to the ideas of men. That's one of its qualities. Yes. So just because you've made up an idea or concept about God, it doesn't mean that that's the truth about God. It just means it's your idea or concept about God. And sooner or later, you're going to have to come to terms with the fact that it's your idea or concept and it's not necessarily God's truth mm. about God or about the universe or about the human soul, or about science, or about mathematics, or about any subject, in fact. What, what we need to come to terms with is that just because we have a personal idea, it means nothing in reality to what is God's truth mm -hmm. about any issue, whether the issue be physical, emotional, spiritual, in nature, it doesn't matter. Soul-based, it doesn't matter. Whatever our ideas are, they will probably have to change if we are going to accept God's truth on a certain matter. Yeah. God's truth will not conform to men's ideas or women's ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of women on the planet I know today seem to have an idea that they have a better idea <laughs> about what is love and truth than men do. Yeah. But the reality is God's truth doesn't conform to humankind's ideas of what that truth is. It is God's truth is what it is. Mm -hmm. It is the reality of the universe. We are the persons who are going to have to discover it at some point if we wish to be happier. And we are going to have to change our concepts. And we're going to be forced into that position through time, through this time process. Yeah. We will eventually come to recognise that what, what's the point of constructing all of these man-made concepts when some of them or none of them may represent God's truth. Mm. Isn't it better to have a scientific process of investigating what God's truths actually are and then bring our lives into harmony with them? Yeah. That would be a better course of action. Mm. But instead of doing that, what mankind has done is they've created a lot of their personal ideas, put them in books and then said, that's how God is. <laughs> and of course, we have whole billions of people practicing their lives around these things now. And, and unfortunately, many of them are desperately unhappy because they're not God's truths. Mm. And that's, a, that's the problem we face. So just um, to finish off this point, something you've got in the notes here is that men who want to hold on to personal truths do not really love God or understand God. Correct. Could you talk to that a little bit? Perhaps? Yeah, talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Yes, the... the we don't understand, like, I find this happening a lot with religious people. They come up with a lot of concepts about God, which are not godlike at all. They're not even loving at all, most of them. They're not truth, they're not divine truth, but they are their own personal opinion. And then what they do is they think that that means they have a relationship with God. Mm. They think that that means that it makes them holy. And it doesn't. The only holiness that can ever result in a person is when love enters their soul from God. Yeah. And the only truth or knowledge, real knowledge, that can ever enter a person must come from God, from God's understanding of the universe. When you construct your own ideas and then believe you're holy as a result of them, you don't love God at all. You love yourself. That's all you love. Mm. And I would and suggest you don't even love that very well <laughs> because if you truly loved yourself, you'd want to know God's opinion rather than your own. Yeah. <laughs> don't we just love the construction, what we've created, the sense yes. of it's pride a, we have? The exactly. Sense, yeah. It's a terrible condition of arrogance. Mm. Basically what we're doing is we're saying to the world that God conforms to our concept of what God is. That's what we're saying to the world. We're saying that God should conform to our concept of what God is. Mm. And we're actually telling the world that they also have to conform to our concept of what God is. And when we do that without any relationship with God, we are arrogant. And yet many people in this condition believe they're holy. Mm. 
Mm. They believe that they are, have a relationship with God and they believe they're doing the right thing. But all they're doing is supporting their own arrogance. That's all they're doing. So we need to see that this is the case, that God's truth in this regard, the quality of God's truth, is never going to conform itself to mankind's ideas. And whenever I construct an idea that I expect my brothers and sisters on the planet to conform to, and I expect God to conform to, it is a display of my own arrogance. Yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> Regarding quality six, mm -hmm. what does a soul-based understanding that divine truth will never and can never accommodate itself to the beliefs of men look like in my personal life? Right. Well, firstly, I won't be always trying to come up with coyotes and concepts about God that I don't know to be true. Mm -hmm. I will have a very open mind and an open heart about what is the truth about God and therefore also what is the truth about the universe God has created, what is the truth about myself and everything in the universe. I will not have fixated ideas that are unable to be changed, I will not also force these fixated ideas upon others. Mm -hmm. I would be humble enough to understand that any idea or concept that I come up with that is not proven to be true needs to first be proven scientifically, mathematically and in experience to be true before we can actually accept that it is God's truth. And as such, I would not be... Uh, postulating ideas and concepts that come from myself in order just to gain the adulation or adoration or, or honour of mankind. I would actually be doing things for a much more pure reason than having self-aggrandisement as the underlying reason for my actions with regard to the creation of my understanding of truth. Yeah. Something you've written here is that I refuse to bow to the beliefs of men, even if threatened with death, rather than live in divine truth. Yes. So here basically what we're saying is that, remember in previous example, we said that, that error always fights for itself. Mm -hmm. So once we do finish up receiving a divine truth through this developing relationship with God and receiving divine love, we, truths are exposed to us that we eventually accept. We now have a, if you like, a, a, the desire that develops within us to honour this truth under all circumstances and conditions. That means that if we're threatened, even with our own death, we will still continue to honour the truth. Yeah. We won't conform to man's opinions about what we should believe or what we should accept as truth. Mm -hmm. So this can be very confronting at times particularly if it's your own death that's involved, <laughs> is very confronting. And I've been in that position myself, so I know how confronting it can be to be confronted with the fact that you are not going to compromise and you know you're going to die as a result of it through the actions of others because they wish to defend the error. Not only defend it, they're willing to attack as a result of their error. And, and so... Once you have this idea or concept in your heart that this quality is, I am never going to conform to the ideas of men. Once I know something to be certainly true, I will not be able to bend on that issue. I will not be able to bend even if my life is threatened. I would never take an action to threaten someone else's life because that would be out of harmony with truth. Mm -hmm. But other people may take actions to threaten my life and I would not bend. Mm. on the particular subject. In mm. The... Mm. Mm. Another one. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not compromise my beliefs, even if it means I lose my friends or family members. Mm. We talked about this a bit in some other answers. With the answer given. about compromise. Yeah. But uh, when we talk about humans' beliefs, what we're talking about is not just humans' beliefs generally or religiously, we're talking even about the beliefs of our own family. Yeah. Now, this is where most people find a lot of struggle with this particular quality 
they, they sort of see like, yeah, I don't want to conform to, you know, the world belief about this or the world belief about that or the world, this religion's belief about that. But when it comes to the family, there are so many emotions involved of trying to get the family's approval, the family's acceptance and so forth, that we often and very frequently deny God's truth on certain subjects in order to appease or please our family. Mm -hmm. And if we truly had this feeling in our heart that God's truth doesn't compromise for the beliefs of men, we wouldn't do that. We would honour God's truth under all circumstances as God's truth, that, that we, are, we, we actually become immovable, as immovable on the truth that's entered us as God is on, the, on that truth. And as a result, even when threatened with discommunic like excommunication. excommunication from our family or excommunication from a religion or excommunication from a political party or excommunication from a work situation or whatever, we do not compromise. Yeah. We honour God's truth first, not subsequent to what humans' ideas or beliefs are. Mm. That's what we do. Okay, another one. Mm -hmm. When we have this soul-based understanding of this quality, we're not willing, we are willing to be the only person on earth who accepts the state of love and truth. Yes. Now, I can speak about this from my own example. In the first century, for much of my time in the first century, I was the only person on earth who accepted one of God's truths. Yeah. Now, what I find interesting is from a scientific perspective, this sort of happens all the time from a, in, in terms of physical analysis of things. So there are many scientists in the past who have had the same thing happen to them, where they have been the very first person to accept something that nobody else before them and many people of their peers refused to accept. But it was a God, one of God's truths. Yeah. And I've had to go through the same situation with regard to spiritual matters. Now, when we honour God's truth above everything else, we don't bend on those issues. And many of these, sci many of these scientists have been um, so positive in terms of the human race because when you think about it, without them staying firm mm. to what they knew to be true, mm -hmm. our very society would be very different now than it, is, than it currently is. Yeah with regard to many of these science, science, science people, people in science or physics that have discovered certain truths. We, you know, we wouldn't have things like even light if one person who first discovered these particular things didn't hold on to the truth they'd discovered, right? And, and even that being laughed at and ridiculed by other people, they hold on to these particular truths. And this is something that is a very much about strength of character. Once, once we know something to be God's truth for certain, it creates such a certainty within you as an individual that it's very, very hard to not uphold it, <laughs> actually. You have to break one of God's laws, in fact, to not uphold it. Yeah. And so it becomes very important then for us to, to not bend for the sake of other people's belief systems or for the sake of preventing their rage or anger or for the sake of financial reasons or any other purpose. And, and this is how more truth comes to be on the planet. Mm. 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 Okay. I desire to act in truth and love even if ridiculed, denigrated, shamed or threatened. Mm. So this is like, a, a, I suppose you could say, an extension of the idea of even if I have to die for it. Yeah. Um, this is, I don't respond, I always respond in truth and love even if I'm threatened or denigrated or humiliated or any of the other things where I haven't actually died, but uh, sometimes it's easier dying than, <laughs> than yes. feeling all of those things because yes. um, dying is a much quicker and more painless process yes. oftentimes yeah. than receiving all of these other things. And, uh, and so I would still uphold the truth even if I was the only person doing it and even if I was ridiculed by the entire rest of the world I yeah. would still uphold the truth yeah. that's the level of firmness I would have if I fully understood that God's truth doesn't conform itself to the beliefs of man mm. just because all mankind believes something it doesn't mean it's that it's true <laughs> yeah 
All right, another interesting one. I feel the effects of untruth on mankind in general and in each situation I personally face. Yes. So the beauty of doing of this is because you're not compromising all the time, mm -hmm. you see God's truth and you see human truth, which is often error. Mm. And what you see then, because you understand God's truth in your soul, you start seeing the reasons why everything happens on earth the way it does. Yeah. You start seeing the contrast between what would happen if everyone did it God's way and what happens because they do it their way. And you see the difference in every single case. So it's like all of a sudden you become super aware of everything around you as to why it's happening and what out of harmony with love is the, and truth is the reason why it's happening. Mm -hmm. and, and because you don't honour man's condition, you acknowledge it and you have compassion for it, but you don't honour it, you don't, you, know, you don't live by it. You often then can stand out as an example of of a person living outside of the boundaries of what humankind defines as truth. And, and then you can demonstrate through the life you have the difference between living in harmony with all of God's truth and living outside of it and what living outside of it does. Because mm. all of humanity is generally engaged outside of God's truth. And so when you live inside of God's truth, there's a direct contrast between your own condition and theirs and a direct contrast in your own analysis of every event. Mm. And this is very powerful in terms of helping your understanding. And this is one of the ways that truth, when we receive it and are willing to act in harmony with what we have received, supports us to receive more truth, isn't mm. it? Mm. Because we begin to feel the effects in, by observing in people around us, yes. when we're no longer willing to compromise, when we see now even more clearly the effects of their compromise, this almost supports us, or it does support us, to receive more truth. Mm. And the, the less we compromise on that truth, the more supported we are to see more truth and receive more of God's truth, aren't we? Yes, it also helps us with qualities like humility, mm -hmm. because we go, ah, oh, the lack of humility in the human race has caused them to think all of this is real and it's not real. It helps us with the qualities like faith mm -hmm. because we go, wow, look at my life. My life's much happier than theirs generally and my life's much better than theirs generally. Look what's like I understand everything that's happening in my life now. So that causes us to have faith that the process works. Yeah. It also helps us with regard to love because we, we can see that, wow, we see the results of a lack of love in people's day-to-day -day life. And then we can contrast it with our own, you know, life. And we see, well, okay, there's areas where I lack love and look what happened. And there's mm -hmm. areas where I engaged in harmony with love and look what happened there. And so we have this much more sensitive and aware nature when we honour this truth that we, when we stop trying to conform to mankind's ideas. And, and really, we also confront the fear as well, the fear of everyone's disapproval. Yeah. The fear, and, and this is one of the major reasons why humankind hasn't grown much more than it has over the, over, the, over the centuries, is because most of us are so afraid of everyone else's opinion that we're afraid to have a different opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and because we're so afraid of different opinions, um, and the different opinions are generally attacked, and we're afraid of attack, we, we generally don't try to find new truth. And so we end up in this stagnant condition that remains for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And this is why we had periods like the Dark Ages where thousands of years of lack of development occurred as a result of the imposition of falsehood, mankind's truths, yeah. falsehood, upon the earth. Mm. And if we had accepted God's truth during that period, things would have changed much more rapidly. Yeah. Mm. Okay, final point on this quality if we understand that divine truth will never accommodate itself to the beliefs of men, then we never justify the fear or anger-based positions of men mm -hmm. to indicate their lack of belief in God. Yeah. Exactly. Remember, fear and anger-based... Anger is really like the denial of addictions and fear is all about you know, wanting addictions to cover over your fears. So, mm. so fear, addictions and anger are all linked with each other. And what we would do is we would never deny them in another person. We would always want to help them expose it. We would always see them as beliefs. So we don't just see concepts as beliefs. We see emotions that are out of harmony with love as beliefs. 
And, we, and once we start to see them as beliefs, we start seeing that this is where we need to operate in harmony with love and truth. And God's system of that, God's truth about all those things, that one of this quality of divine truth is that it's very, very different to men's ideas about emotions. Yeah. Very different to mankind's ideas about beliefs. All humankind's ideas about emotions and beliefs are are able to be prevented in terms of their negative consequences if we brought them into harmony with love and truth. Mm -hmm. God knows that. People don't know that. And, and if we compromise, then we just fit in with what people know, which is reducing our own ability for happiness and reducing everyone around us, their ability for happiness. So, so we're far better off allowing the confrontation to occur. Yeah. The confrontation between God's truth and human truth. Mm. And, and let it expose what it exposes emotionally. We're far better off doing that than we are trying to circumnavigate the exposure of certain emotions that are out of harmony with God's truth. Okay, great. Quality seven. Mm -hmm. What do you mean when you say divine truth results in freedom? Yes, so God's truth results in freedom. Or in the first century, I used to say, the truth will set you free, <laughs> which is much the same thing. Well, when you think about divine truth, it, because it is the truth of the universe, every time we bring ourselves into harmony with it, we are bringing ourselves into harmony with its operation, with all the laws that, it, it, that are determined by the truth. When we bring ourselves into harmony with something, everything's smoother, everything's easier, therefore more free. Mm -hmm. Everything flows easier, everything happens easier. Everything's more free. Whenever we bring ourselves into opposition with something, and particularly in regards to divine truth, whenever we bring ourselves into opposition with divine truth, all of the laws, all of the truths are attempting to correct us. Mm -hmm. So it's like placing a prison around us in order to correct us. So we're going through a correctional institution now. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, that's what's happening. And, and so when we live in harmony with divine truth, we have this freedom. When we live out of harmony with divine truth, it creates restriction, confinement, slavery. Yeah. And divine truth, God's truth, always results in more freedom. But it's not a freedom that where you're free and I'm more enslaved. Yeah. It's a freedom that is equal in its operation. It's a freedom where everyone becomes freer. Everyone becomes more loving as a result of this kind of freedom. So it's not a freedom where some people are free and the rest of us are in slavery. It's a freedom where everyone can become freer once they accept the particular truths involved. And this is a very, very important aspect of divine truth, that it results in complete freedom in so many ways. It is the doorway to love. It's, it's the, and what I mean by that is that it opens our heart to love. It, it helps us understand that love is available mm. and it also helps us understand the way in which love is available. And therefore, it causes a huge amount of happiness by its absorption. So it results in freedom and happiness as a result of the freedom. So, so this particular quality of divine truth is so important to understand. Every time that we feel more confined... It's because we don't understand enough truth. And usually that means it's because we are afraid of something. Yeah. Fear is the false appearing real to us, the false appearing true. And usually when we act in fear, we feel more confined. We feel more enslaved. When we act in truth, we feel less confined, less enslaved. It sets us free. So if you examine the, like the world's political systems, the world's religious systems and a lot of other systems on the planet, you can see that many of the belief systems must be out of harmony with God's truth because many of them create confinement. They create slavery. Mm. They create a lack of freedom, in fact. And this tells us that many even of our own laws must be out of harmony with divine truth. Yeah. And if we analyse everything that happens in the world with regard to this one aspect of creating freedom for everyone equally, yes, and this not, is just, a, not for just for one, one person, person yeah. it's for everyone equally, then we start to understand 
the beauty of divine law and truth. Remember, divine truth is law. It is the truth of the universe, so therefore it is law. So we could say the law of gravity, or we could call it the truth of gravity. We could call the law of aerodynamics, or we could call it the truth of aerodynamics. Now, there are lots of laws or truths that humankind have yet to discover that have been discovered in the spirit world, like the law of repentance, or the truth about repentance, or the law of forgiveness, the truth about forgiveness, the law of love, the truth about love. And if once we start understanding all of these particular things with regard to divine laws and truths, then we see that this particular quality of creating freedom is quite remarkable. It, it creates so much freedom, in fact, that by the time you've become at one with God, you feel completely free to express your will in any way you desire without a restriction. Mm. And I find it interesting because many people who listen to Divine Truth feel that it's quite restrictive. And I'm going, yes, that's very strange. Mm -hmm. It only is restrictive because you want to hold on to the error. And it's the error that's restricting you, in fact. The error position is the thing, the belief, that, or the thing that is restricting your life. And restricting our joy and restricting our receipt of love. and Restricting actually, your power, yeah. restricting your ability to create, restricting everything. In fact, if people on earth knew how much their so-called freedom, which is not governed by truth but rather by enslavery, mm. if they realised how much it was restricting them, they'd give it up instantly. But it's only until generally people have progressed for many years in the spirit world before they realise how restricted they were when they're on earth with their belief systems mm -hmm. and how much slavery it created. So it's very, this is very important to understand this principle of this or quality of divine truth that it always results in more freedom for everyone. Mm -hmm. So if it results in more freedom for you at the same time as more slavery for me, it's not divine truth. For it to be divine truth, it has to result in more freedom for you and more freedom for me. That Then it's divine truth. Yeah, mm. yeah I agree. This is regarding quality seven. Mm -hmm. What does a soul-based understanding that divine truth results in freedom look like in my personal life? <laughs> well, firstly, I stop wanting laws that are made by humans to govern my life. I, in fact, stop needing them. And what I mean by that is I allow myself to be governed by the law of love in all aspects. So I, I choose, purposefully choose, to no longer act out of harmony with love because I know every time I act out of harmony with love, I'm creating slavery for myself or for others. And so therefore, I'm not in harmony with this particular idea or concept that divine truth always results in freedom. When I act out of harmony with the laws of love, I am harming other people, either purposefully or in a state of ignorance. I am still harming them. And when I harm other people, I am creating hardship for them, yeah. which is a lack of freedom. So, so I start to desire to love because it's the right thing to do. Mm. I start to desire it because I want it, not because I'm forced into it yeah. by law. And, uh, and this is the freeing part of the laws of love, is that when you act in harmony with the laws of love, it's fairly automatic for you to act in harmony with almost every law mm. that God has. And every truth, if you... And every truth. Yeah. If you think of law yeah, as truth, truth. Yeah. every truth that God has. Yeah. And this is the beauty of acting in harmony or in such a way. It results in this magnificent freedom that is not available to you when you're acting from some other motive. Mm. Mm. Okay, let's talk through a few of the notes that you've made here. Sure. So when we have a soul-based understanding that divine truth results in freedom, we live a completely free existence, mm -hmm. free from others' opinions, addictions and desires, and we promote the freedom of others. Yes. So th there's two aspects to this, isn't there? Firstly, we live free from every, everyone else's opinions and, and desires. Now, this is a very interesting fact. Because we're living in harmony with love, 
we, we now feel completely free from judgment, from, mm. from other people telling us what to do. We don't feel inclined to do what other people tell us what to do because we honour the fact that we're free. Yeah. We honour the fact that we have free will. We're allowed to decide and for ourselves what we do. We honour the fact that if we use that in harmony with love, it will always turn out to the best outcome. If we use it out of harmony with love, we know it's always going to be terrible. So what we do is we choose to use it in harmony with love. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's one of the first things we do. So the second aspect of it, though, which was? To promote the freedom of others. Yes. Mm. This aspect is interesting. What we see often happening on the planet is people promote their own freedom at mm. the expense of the freedom of others. Yeah. And this is not how God's truth, this is not a quality of God's truth. And it's also an indication that those people haven't had God's truth enter them exactly. on these issues. Exactly. Yeah. So I would not promote my own freedom just so that you can have more slavery. Yeah. Because I would honour the fact that we are equal. And if I loved you as much as I loved myself, I would actually honour your freedom as much as my own. And so therefore I would never take an action to harm your freedom. I would never attempt to enslave you in any way, either enslave you with vices, you know, such as drugs or alcohol or other vices, or enslave you physically, or enslave you sexually, or enslave you in any other, emotionally or in any other way. I would never take an action to choose those things. I would never become a pusher of a drug mm -hmm. as a result of that. I would never become a pusher of alcohol. I would never become a pusher of emotional addictions if I honoured this fact because I would like to create your freedom, not your enslavery. Yeah. And when I saw a person gravitating towards slavery, I would want to free them. So I would try at least to have, because of my love for them, I would try at least to talk with them about that. Now, if they didn't want to hear, I would also promote that as their freedom. Yeah. <laughs> but they're allowed yes. to choose to not want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd promote that too. Okay, another one. I do not allow others' opinions, addictions or desires to influence me away from living in love. Yes. So this is where because I know I'm free and I'm allowed to have my own choices and decisions, I stop being so invested in everyone else's opinions and desires for my life. Mm -hmm. And this is a, there's interesting flavours to this in the sense that I, I, I actually now listen less to what other people would say I should do. Mm -hmm. And I am more focused on what I feel God would what, like me to do or what love would dictate that I do. In other words, I'm more focused on knowing the truth of how I should act rather than other people's opinions about how I should act, which may, may or may not be truth. So I'm very focused now on allowing my own sense of freedom to exist. And that's a very important factor. A lot of people don't have that in their day-to-day -day life no. because they are so confined by other people's opinions. They have investments in other people's opinions. When I'm in this state, I no longer invest in other people's opinions. I don't, I don't want your opinion just so that I can feel good. I'm willing to feel bad and not have your good opinion yeah. or not even have your opinion at all. Mm. I'm willing to go through my own doubts without trying to have you make my doubts go away. I'm willing to own my own emotions because I understand that's my way to freedom mm. rather than have you try to get me to do something or rather than listen to what you think I should do, which would create slavery to you. Yeah. I don't do that. I choose to not do that. I don't want a guru anymore. Mm. I want a relationship with God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want a guru anymore. I don't want a priest anymore. Yeah. I want a relationship with God. I don't want somebody showing me, telling me what to do. I want somebody who's willing to talk to me and discuss with me what they feel God's opinions are. And how I can develop. And how you can develop and know those things. Yeah. I certainly would like that. Yeah. But I wouldn't automatically do what that person suggests without some experiment. Mm -hmm. And this allows me to have a set of course of self-determination in my life, which is the way God created you to be, yeah. in fact. Yeah. To engage your personality, engage your passion, engage your desires, engage the f fact that you've been given this gift of will. It's yours. <laughs> it's not anybody else's. 
This gift of free will is yours. It's not anybody else's. So, so don't give it away. <laughs> Learn to use it yourself. That's what's going to create your own freedom. Yeah. 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 All right, next mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. I act fully on all of my own desires, harmonious with love, even when others oppose them. Exactly. So I don't have this idea that in order to love, everybody's got to agree with me. I know when things are loving and because I continue to have this connection with God while I'm in this place. I know that I'm, a, I'm allowed to make choice and decisions that are loving mm -hmm. and, and be completely harmonious with all of God's laws. And so I choose to act upon them even if everyone else disagrees with me. Yeah. And in fact, by choosing to act on them when everyone else disagrees with me, I help them go through what is true, what is not. Yeah. What is love, what is not. I help them work through these issues by acting in harmony with love and truth myself. Whenever I respect the person's opinions that are out of harmony with love and truth that I've discovered, all I'm doing is harming myself, harming them, and both of us no longer have the ability to determine what is true and no longer have any freedom. So I, I'm far better at least having one of us have freedom <laughs> than having two of us enslaved by our own desires to meet each other's addictions. Yeah, great. Mm. Okay, I honour my own beliefs even when others disagree with them. Mm -hmm. So a very similar that. principle. Yep. Yep. I honour and experience my own emotions at all times, in all situations, without reserve. Yes. So I have the freedom to express myself emotionally without feeling confined by my environment. I know that God has given me this gift with, of freedom. Yeah. This, and God's, all of God's truth revolve around freedom. So whenever anybody tries to confine me emotionally, I know they're out of harmony with God's truth. Every time they try to stop me from feeling a certain feeling that is in harmony with love, I know they're out of harmony with God's truth. Yeah. Even when they try to stop me feeling a feeling that is out of harmony with God's love, but I'm doing it in a way that's harmonious. In other words, for example, if I have anger or rage mm -hmm. and I go out and bash the bag instead of hurting somebody with it, yeah. that's more in harmony with God's truth. I honour the fact that I'm allowed to do that. Yeah. And particularly if I'm in my own environment and nobody else has to hear it, I'm definitely allowed to do that. Yeah. As soon as I'm out of my own environment and everyone else has to hear it, now I'd I would be out of harmony with love, forcing it upon them. Yeah. Because that, that would be out of harmony with the gift of free will, which is one of the previous ones we've discussed. But if I'm in harmony with freedom and in harmony with free will, I would choose to feel all of my emotions in my own privacy without expecting anyone else share in it and without expecting that anybody else would ever attack me for it. Mm. I would do it because I love myself. Yeah. And I love freedom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. All right. Um, this is a good one for me. Yeah. <laughs> I do not ever blame another person for controlling or attempting to control me. Yes. Because I'm honouring that I have free will, as we discussed in the previous point, and in this case we're honouring that guy, I have been given freedom and as long as I live in harmony with truth, it will create freedom then I wouldn't blame somebody else for trying to push me around. Yeah. I would go, okay, they pushed me around and I allowed it. <laughs> Why did I allow it? Yes. Why did I put myself into the slavery of another person, yeah. of listening to another person? Why did I do that? There must be a reason why I chose that. And I wouldn't blame the other person for my reason. I would work through emotionally why I chose to have a life of slavery rather than freedom. And this is something really crucial that I am still learning about spirits and mm -hmm. a spirit attack. When, when um, I feel so attacked or bullied and I just want to submit and oh, just do what they want so that I don't have to feel mm -hmm. fear. Mm -hmm. And this is very much, I feel, God teaching us about our will, isn't it? That we have this freedom, we can make a different choice you can to make not a different comply choice. Yeah. and just feel. True. Choose to feel your fear, yeah. which is the reason for their attack. Yeah. Right? That allows their attack. That allows their attack. 
Feel your fear. Mm. Realize that even the attack itself is a method by which you can heal something within yourself. That's yeah. real freedom. Yeah, it is. Like to it's know very that, empowering. It's very empowering it? to, to, to know that somebody's attack of you, can, if you allow yourself to be humble to the emotion, you will feel attacked, you will feel oppressed, you will probably have a good cry about it, you'll feel some fear about it, you'll probably have a good cry about that too, and after that it will be gone. And you'll feel free. <laughs> and this is where knowing divine truth is literally a ticket to freedom because yes. there is no such thing as a problem you can't solve. Exactly. Because you faced with something, you know what you can do, you know the laws governing it. Yes. Uh, and even if you don't know all of them, because we can't know all of God's truths, mm -hmm. we can understand some principles and we know that humility will yep. liberate us. Yes. And so... There's not actually an issue where we ever can feel stumped anymore. No, and that even applies to death. Mm -hmm. We don't even see death as a lack of freedom yeah. because the reality is it isn't. Yeah. Once we fully have absorbed divine truth, we understand there's no such thing as death of who we are. There's no such thing of death of our experience. There's no such thing of death of our ability to, to you know, utilise our emotions and feel and think and be free-thinking and free-feeling th people. And so we're not even afraid of death anymore. Yeah. We have so much freedom that we're not afraid of anything anymore, Pretty including cool. death. Yeah. 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 Okay, two more. I only respond in love when others attempt to manipulate or control me. So that's sort of linked to what we were just saying. That's right. So, so when other people try to manipulate and control us, because we're not worried about having to do what they want, we just be loving with them. Yeah. So, so you've seen me do that frequently yes. when we stay with people and yeah. so forth. You feel the manipulations that we get frequently. And I can still just sit there and love them and not get angry. And, because, but not comply. Either. And not comply, yeah. and, but not get angry. And the reason why I don't get angry is because I don't feel like I have to comply. Yeah. I don't feel like I have to do what they're saying. Yeah. I know that I don't. Yeah, to, you feel this freedom. I feel this, a sense of freedom. Yeah. This uh, truth. And I sort of observe entered. their projections at me and even their rage that I'm not doing what I want. But, but to me, that's their stuff. And, and I don't feel obliged to be forced into doing what somebody else wants me to do because I know that God's given me the gift of free will. God's given me freedom. Mm. And all of God's truths would help me be free. Yeah. And I, I therefore know that whenever they're trying to control me, they're not helping me be free. <laughs> they're wanting to control me. That's not freedom. That's control. And whenever somebody attempts to control me, they're not helping me to be free. And so I don't conform mm. <laughs> to the, the, their desire that I become under their control. Yeah. Okay, final one, which is very beautiful. When we have this soul-based understanding that divine truth results in freedom, we're so free that nothing in our environment interferes with our connection with God. Yes. So this is a real, once we become at one with God, this is how it is. We, we, we are so free with everything that there's literally not a single event in our, that could be perpetrated against us, not a single event that we could attract in our personal life. There's not a single thing that can happen to us, including death, that would upset our relationship with God, mm -hmm. that would upset our sense of freedom that and, and it's a reality of freedom not just a sense of it we know we're completely free in that place and because of that you imagine the freedom that creates it's like it, it's most people on earth have never even can e cannot even imagine what that would be no. like let alone feel what it would be like in today's circumstances so this aspect or quality of god's truth results in freedom or truth sets you free yeah is a very important quality to understand about divine truth. And many, it, it's quite life-changing when it does enter your soul. Once it, it enters your soul, yeah. it changes the way you interact with almost everyone around you. All of a sudden, instead of being angry about what they try to do to you, you're no longer angry about what they're trying to do to you. You're no longer upset with what they're trying to do to you because you now know you have a perfect sense of freedom and feel this perfect sense of freedom. You know you don't have to conform. Mm. You know you don't have to do what's being asked of you. You know you have freedom. Mm. And you know you can give a gift of whatever you like to people, but you know that if they're demanding it, you're probably not going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, the, and you have that sense of yourself that's much stronger than the average person has of themselves as a result. So it just creates this beautiful freeing lifestyle. And it's not a freedom where it harms other people. Mm. It's a freedom that's in perfect harmony 
with how other people want to live their life. Yeah, mm. very beautiful. Mm. Thank you, Darwin, for this discussion. Yeah.